on C-SPAN 3. Next, on Lectures in History, University of Michigan professor Melissa Borja teaches a class about Southeast Asian migration to the United States and post-Vietnam War refugees. She examines how laws and public opinion have changed over the past five decades and emphasizes the difference between immigrants and refugees. Her class is about an hour. Today, we're going to talk about topic 18, which is Southeast Asian refugee migrations. And if you have been following the news in recent years, I imagine that you, like me, have found it difficult to ignore the topic of refugees. This is an image of a refugee's experience fleeing communist Vietnam um, in 1975, but in many ways it reminds us of images that we might see on the news today. It's hard to ignore the human stories of families perishing at sea. Refugees are suffocating in meat trucks. They're crowding onto leaky boats. They're drowning. The bodies of those who are unable to cross to safety are washing up on Mediterranean beaches. And refugees have been in the news for the past few years, particularly related to the crisis in Syria, but refugees are being uprooted by conflict all around the world. So we're not just talking about refugees coming from Syria, but from other war-torn regions. Especially in the past couple years, it has also been very difficult to ignore the public response to refugees. And refugee resettlement, like so many other topics today, has become a polarizing topic. On one hand, opposition to refugees has been fierce and even hostile. Politicians at the local, state, and federal level have linked refugees to terrorism and have pursued anti-refugee policies in the name of national security. The most famous of these measures is President Donald Trump's executive orders, which ground the federal refugee program virtually to a halt in January 2017. His imposition of what is widely known as the refugee ban shortly after taking office initiated one of the sharpest legal and political debates of his presidency and is part of a broader effort to limit the number of foreigners who are able to enter the United States. To be sure, politicians are not the only ones who have taken action on the issue of refugees. There have also been instances of vigilante anti-refugee activism, some of it potentially violent, and much of it centered specifically on Muslim refugees. For example, in Shelbyville and Murfreesboro, Tennessee, there were rallies led by white nationalists and neo-Nazis. But it's also hard to ignore the fact that there has been a tremendous amount of public support for refugees. The January 2017 executive orders prompted thousands of Americans to protest and facilitate legal aid at airports across the country. Community groups organized rallies and service projects to to raise awareness of the issue of refugees. People put signs declaring their support for refugees on their front lawns or above their church entryways or even on stickers on their laptops. Now, I'm a historian, and my job is to remind you that we need to have some historical perspective. The truth is that in many ways, we have been here before. I've already pointed to this image of a boat. This is an image from 1975, but it could very well be an image of people fleeing by boat today. We've seen these images before. We've seen a vicious eruption of anti-refugee sentiment before. We've seen a generous pro-refugee response before. We've seen anxiety about religious and cultural difference before. We've worried about refugees and national security before. Now, I am frustrated a little bit 
by our contemporary conversation because so much of our contemporary conversation is not paying attention to our history and lessons we can learn from the past. We especially don't hear a lot about Asian refugees. We might hear a little bit more about Jewish refugees, but not that much about Asian refugees. Now, I've made the case this entire semester that Asian American history is American history. And this is true for refugee history as well. So today I'm going to talk about Asian refugee migrations that took place four decades ago. And this refugee migration, I argue, changed the course of refugee history in the United States for the decades to come. I'm going to talk about refugees known as the Ugandan Asian refugees and Southeast Asian refugees. They arrived in the 1970s and 1980s, some of them as late as the beginning of the 21st century. And the migration of these Asian refugees was a turning point in several different ways. Number one, in the 1970s, refugees were accepted for new reasons. For the first time, the United States wasn't just accepting refugees because they opposed communism. The United States was accepting refugees on the basis of emerging humanitarian commitments to human rights. Number two, during this period, refugees were accepted and resettled in a new way. We're talking about a huge refugee migration here. Over a million Southeast Asian refugees came to the United States in the last couple decades of the 20th century. And that refugee migration and the amount of work that it took to coordinate relief and resettlement efforts, both overseas and domestically, made government officials realize that they needed to have a more systematic and organized and permanent way to respond to refugee crises. So it's in part because of Southeast Asian refugees in particular that we see the emergence of a push for new legislation, which culminated in the 1980 Refugee Act. This act is still in force today, and I'll talk about the details of that act later. Number three, another reason why Southeast Asian refugee migrations and also Ugandan Asian uh, refugee migrations matter these Asian refugees were at the beginning of a new wave of refugees, a new refugee population. They were the first group of non-white, non-European, non-Christian refugees to be resettled in the United States. There had been Cuban refugees and Jewish refugees, I'll talk about that later, but this was the first huge group of non-white, non-European, non-Christian refugees. And these refugees were so different that it was a source of great anxiety for Americans. In truth, these refugees ended up being the forerunner for f refugee populations who would arrive in the United States in subsequent decades. So these refugees, in many ways, set um, the groundwork for how the United States would resettle refugees but also were a harbinger for what would come. In some Asian refugees, Ugandan Af Asian refugees and Southeast Asian refugees in particular, were at the center of major changes in the 1970s and profoundly changed U.S. Uh, and its approach to refugees in the decades to come. Now, if any of you like literature, you'll know that we have been talking about Asian refugees. In fact, the history of Vietnamese refugees has received a lot of attention in the past couple years because of this book, The Sympathizer by Viet Thanh Nguyen, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2016. And you are reading an excerpt from this novel uh, this week, and we'll discuss it next week. Viet Thanh Nguyen himself was a refugee. And he's reflected a lot about what it means to be a refugee and a writer and to tell his story. In an essay he published in the New York Times, he observed the following. Many people have characterized my novel, The Sympathizer, as an immigrant story and me as an immigrant. No. My novel is a war story. And I am not an immigrant. 
I am a refugee who, like many others, has never ceased being a refugee in some corners of my mind. He continues, immigrants are more reassuring than refugees because there is an end point to their story. However they arrive, whether they are documented or not, their desires for a new life can be absorbed into the American dream or into the European narrative of civilization. By contrast, refugees are zombies of the world, the undead who rise from dying states to march or swim toward our borders in endless waves. So let's stop and think about this line for a little bit. What do you think he means by saying that immigrants are different from refugees? Raise hands. Okay. I think that like there's um, a a choice that um, immigrants take to build their own like new future, whereas like with um, the refugee crises that we see now, there's often like a push mm -hmm. that forces them to leave their own countries and migrate somewhere else just because of like a failure of government mm -hmm. or or reasons that they don't have control over themselves. Absolutely. So there is a forced migration that characterizes refugee migrations rather than immigrants who as you point out have more of a choice. I also think with refugees, there's um, somewhat of a connotation that when their home country, like when the turmoil stops in their home country, a lot of times they would be okay going back versus an immigrant came to this country by their own choice to like build a new life or whatever the reason is. And so um, for a refugee, the reason we would like welcome them in is because we're like housing them until they go back. Um, but with an immigrant, like that connotation isn't there. Mm -hmm. yes. So the ability to be able to return to your home country. We've talked about how a lot of immigrants migrate to the United States or elsewhere and then return home. But refugees don't have that option. That's a really important point. Because they have been forced out due to war, persecution, natural disaster, any number of reasons that make their life in their previous country impossible. They would not survive. So I think you're exactly right. Refugee migrations is characterized by a need for survival. What do you think he means when he says that refugees are zombies of the world? I thought that was evocative. Zombies of the world. The undead who rise from dying states. Um, in a way, like they are the only vessels of culture left of these dying states. And it's really hard to get someone to, you know, completely forfeit their culture because it is part of their identity. So as long as they live, the culture lives. Yes. Okay. So I think this is really powerful. They are often vessels of their culture. They are leaving desperate situations where they would have otherwise died physically, and perhaps also their community would have died, their culture would have died. And so this idea of people leaving dying states in circumstances of profound dislocation and trauma is really powerful. I think that language of zombies is really powerful because it reminds us of the desperation, the violence, the fear that people leave, that pushes people to migrate. And I think that it's important for us to remember that this violence, that this suffering, that this persecution, that this upheaval that forced them to migrate doesn't just and there, but continues to shape their lives in years to come. So Viet Tien Nguyen calls attention to, I think, the two most important aspects of refugees and what distinguishes them from immigrants. Number one, they are involuntary migrants, as you pointed out already, forcibly removed by their homes due to political conflict, natural disaster, or other extraordinary circumstances. And they are often very traumatized people. Zombies, as he would say. The interesting thing about refugees is they are 
powerful in our mythology of American exceptionalist immigration history. Think about the poem that's on the Statue of Liberty, the New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. In it, Emma Lazarus describes the Statue of Liberty as the mother of exiles, who says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. How many of you have heard those lines before? So famous. And the fact that those lines are on the, the Statue of Liberty, which is a symbol of immigration in the United States, is really powerful. It really centers the United States, or the idea of the United States as being a welcoming haven for people who are exiles. Unfortunately, the history of the United States tells a somewhat different, more complicated story. The truth is we haven't always had the humanitarian impulse to welcome refugees. Usually, we've only done so when it's in our humanitarian national interest. Usually, we've been more inclined to actually reject refugees than to accept them. And to borrow the words of historian Eric Tang, often refugees who have been accepted for resettlement here are not only resettled, but are also deeply unsettled by the experience of forced migration and resettlement in the United States. <coughs> to give you an overview of what I'll talk about today, I'll give you a little bit of background about American refugee resettlement policy after the Second War. And then I'm going to use that background to set up why the 1970s were such an important period of change. That's when a small group of Ugandan Asian refugees first arrived in the United States, and they were followed by an even larger group of refugees, Southeast Asian refugees, who are alternatively described as Indo-Chinese refugees. These included refugees from Vietnam, Laos, Cambodian, and Cambodia. I'll talk about the crisis that developed overseas, but I'll focus mostly on developments that took place here in the United States. How the general public viewed Southeast Asian refugees, how Southeast Asian refugees were admitted and resettled, and how Southeast Asian refugees themselves tell stories about their experience. I'll tease out why the history of Southeast Asian refugee resettlement matters, and I'll conclude with some discussion about how Southeast Asian Americans today are drawing on their refugee history to intervene in contemporary public policy debates. Okay, any questions so far? So let's begin with some background about refugee resettlement in the United States during the 20th century. During the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, most refugees came from Europe, with the exception of Cuban refugees. Most were white and either Jewish or Christian. And during this period, right after the Second World War um, and during the Cold War, an, a commitment to opposing communism really shaped how the United States determined which refugees to accept. Now, during and after World War II, the United States changed its immigration policies to accept people displaced by war. These refugees were known as displaced persons, and they benefited from the landmark legislation of the time, which was the 1948 Displaced Persons Act. That act eventually expired, and in 1953, it was replaced by the Refugee Relief Act, which helped other European refugees, including Italians, Greeks, and Dutch refugees. In 1956, we see Cold War developments uh, in Europe also shape a new refugee populations and give rise to new groups of people seeking refuge in particular, the Hungarian Revolution occurred, and freedom fighters, as they were popularly known, were welcomed to the United States. They were accepted under what is called parole power, which allowed the United States to accept refugees and circumvent its own immigration laws, which at this time, if you recall, 
uh, were pretty restrictive. Throughout much of the Cold War, the executive branch used a loophole in immigration law, the parole power, to admit refugees when it deemed that it was in the national interest to do so. Most of those refugees admitted were fleeing the left, fleeing left-wing or communist regimes. Finally, in 1959, Cuban exiles began to arrive. The first Cubans who arrived were Batista sympathizers who were feared reprisals from the Castro government. For the first time, because of Cuba's proximity to the United States, the United States was a country of first refuge, meaning refugees didn't go to another country and then apply for resettlement in the United States. They went straight to the United States especially to places like Miami. The policy for Cuban refugees at this time was such that these refugees would be given asylum as part of a bigger anti-Castro, anti-communist policy. A number of requirements were imposed on these early refugee populations. And these requirements illustrated how the United States pursued its own Cold War self-interest. First, As I've already mentioned, the U.S. offered a special welcome for people fleeing communism. Second, preference was given for refugees who were professionals or highly educated or skilled. This was in keeping with other immigration laws of the period. Ultimately, while welcoming displaced people has been seen as a humanitarian act, these humanitarian efforts were often centered on the needs of the United States the helper. These images feature refugees who arrived in the United States during this period. The photo on the left features displaced persons who were registering at Fort Ontario Emergency Refugee Center, which housed a thousand people displaced by World War II. And the photo on the right is the cover of Time magazine in 1957 featuring their chosen Person of the Year in 1956. The Person of the Year 1956 was the Hungarian freedom fighter. So let's think about this. What do you think this image on the right tells us about how Americans viewed Hungarian freedom fighters during this time? Think about what it means for Time Magazine to choose Hungarian freedom fighters as their person of the year and to present them in this way. What does this magazine cover tell us about how Americans viewed Hungarian refugees? Definitely definitely in a positive light. Yeah. Not, Not like a lot different than how we view Syrian refugees today. Yes, really positive. Yeah. Okay, so you can see his face, so bold, so serious, noble. There was enormous enthusiasm for welcoming people who were seen as fighting for freedom, who were seen as being allies in the United States' war against communism. So I think that's a really important image to have in mind, how refugees can be celebrated and how the celebration of refugees converges powerfully with American interests, in particular, this moment, the Cold War. Later in the 20th century, the Cold War continued to shape the United States' stance towards refugee populations, but the last quarter of the 20th century saw a major shift in the world's refugee populations. In 1964, a refugee affairs expert at the World Council of Churches declared, we are now faced with the problem of refugees who are by and large non-white and by and large non-Christian, and it remains to be seen how we will react. Americans were worried about how the United States would handle these new refugees. One pastor in St. Paul, Minnesota explained, 
many problems will arise because of the new influx of people to America as a result of new people coming from different cultures and backgrounds. How would these new immigrants be accepted, he asked. Government leaders also worried about this new immigrant population, new refugee population in particular. During a congressional hearing shortly after the fall of Saigon, Julia Taft, who was of the Interagency Task Force on Indochina Refugees, declared, Never before in the history of this country, Mr. Chairman, have so many people from such different cultures, ethnic and religious backgrounds been introduced into American society in such a short time. What set these refugees apart from previous refugee populations is not simply that they were racially, ethnically, and religiously different, but also that these refugee communities didn't necessarily have a community of people in the United States already to welcome them. So who were these new refugees? Amid the contemporary debate about Muslim refugees from Syria and Somalia, there's been little attention paid to the fact that the United States has been resettling refugees who are Muslim for a long time, and in fact has been since the 1970s. The first Muslim refugees accepted for resettlement were Ugandan Asian refugees. These were Asian origin people who had been expelled from Uganda by Idi Amin. They were resettled in the United States and also the United Kingdom and elsewhere, beginning in 1972. These Ugandan Asian refugees marked a turning point in that they were quite different from their refugee predecessors. They were religiously diverse, identifying as Muslim and also Hindu, Sikh, and Christian. So one big question worth asking, how did it go? A Ugandan Asian refugee who later was a history professor at Bowdoin College named Nazar Motani actually wrote a report called The Brown Diaspora, and he noted that cultural and religious differences were a source of anxiety for both Ugandan Asian refugees and their predominantly Christian sponsors. And he noted that some problems did arise. For example, a strictly vegetarian Brahmin was given work in a poultry processing plant, which did not go so well. He pointed out that it produced significant psychological and emotional strain. And though he praised the good intentions of the sponsors and the voluntary agencies, Mutani said that there needed to be better understanding of the needs of refugees. Overall, though, he said that Ugandan Asian refugees had a pretty positive experience. Now, I mentioned Ugandan Asian refugees because they really set the stage for a larger refugee population that arrived in the 1970s. So a lot of the lessons learned from Ugandan Asian refugee resettlement informed how these groups handled Southeast Asian refugees. Shortly after the arrival of Ugandan Asian refugees, another larger refugee population arrived as a result of war in Southeast Asia. To give you some context about what's happening in Southeast Asia at the time. In 1975, communist governments took control in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And this initiated the outmigration of thousands of people fleeing for their lives. The American public tended to see these refugees as a single group, frequently referred to as the Indochinese. And that category elides a lot of really important differences within the population. These were several different ethnic groups coming from different countries, speaking different languages, having different religions, different class backgrounds, political orientations, and more. (coughs) What united them was the experience of war the trauma of war, the forced migration produced by war, and the experience of having to create a new life in the United States after experiencing the war. These refugees arrived in several waves. The first occurred during the United States' military involvement in the Vietnam War. 
which began in 1965, lasted a decade. By 1971, the war had already caused considerable violence and economic, political, and cultural damage. It had displaced by 1971 approximately 6 million refugees in South Vietnam and 700,000 refugees in Laos. Later, in the fall of Saigon in the spring of 1975, the withdrawal of American military forces caused another outpouring of refugees. In response to this immediate crisis, President Gerald Ford gave the green light to parole in or admit 200,000 Vietnamese refugees. Some of them were evacuated through the help of American military forces. Others fled on their own and were later taken into protective custody by the United States. These Vietnamese refugees in 1975 were placed in several military-run refugee camps on military bases here in the United States. And they stayed there until sponsors could assist their resettlement elsewhere. Now, as 1976 began, Americans thought they were done with the refugee crisis. They had handled those couple hundred thousand refugees who went to those military-run refugee camps. But the crisis was only beginning to heat up at this point. Violence and political conflict in Southeast Asia continued to escalate and continued to spur new refugee migrations. For example, in Cambodia, the Vietnamese invasion of 1978 brought the downfall of the Khmer Rouge and the removal of Pol Pot in January 1979. During Pol Pot's three and a half years in power, the Khmer Rouge had killed 1.7 million people, which was about 21% of the Cambodian population. With Pol Pot no longer in power, approximately half a million Cambodian people who had managed to survive his regime sought refuge in nearby Thailand. An additional 122,000 Cambodian refugees joined them in Thailand between 1980 and 1986. In Vietnam, there was another outpouring of refugees known famously as the Boat People. These people escaped by sea. They were people who had formerly been political, military, or cultural leaders in South Vietnam. Some of them were ethnic minorities who were fleeing persecution. About 160,000 went to China, while tens of thousands took to the oceans and made their way to other places in Southeast Asia, including Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. They sailed in boats that were hardly seaworthy sometimes, and an estimated 25 to 50 percent died at sea. If they were lucky to make it to land, sometimes they were forced back to sea by governments like Thailand and Malaysia that refused to accept them and take responsibility. Those refugees who were fortunate enough to live on and make it to a refugee camp lived in squalid conditions, very difficult conditions in Thailand and elsewhere. And by the middle of 1979, nearly 100,000 Vietnamese boat people were in Malaysia and Hong Kong. Now, so far, I've only talked about refugees from Vietnam and Cambodia, but I should also mention what are known as Hmong and Lao refugees. This is an image of a pandao, which is a traditional Hmong story cloth quilt really embroidery, but a lot of stories about the war have been told through this traditional art form. And so just looking at this image, what do you see? What do you notice? What story of war does it tell? Do you see any depictions of war here? Anyone notice the oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think it's really interesting that the the spanning of like technology is really depicted in yeah. this depiction of war because you, I see like sword fighting, but then I also see planes, which is to me a very funny thing to see embroidered on like a quilt. And I'm also just interested in like the deer to the left mm. slurping at the river, and I guess it kind of like is a nice juxtaposition about how like 
war comes into a landscape, but the landscape still functions as is. And then it would be really cool to like see an aftermath quilt of like what is what would happen. Yeah, absolutely. You call attention to some really key details. You see a river. This river represents the Mekong River, which bordered Laos and Thailand. And you see the airplanes, the helicopters. You see this fascinating juxtaposition of rural life and war. And you see these little boxy buildings, which could represent either the refugee camps or the military sites where Hmong troops organized. You see people in a line, all walking in the same direction, fleeing perhaps for safety. So this represents Hmong experiences during the secret war and their subsequent migration out of Laos to Thailand. Now the United States worked with the Hmong as well as Lao people in their fight against communists during the secret war in Laos in the 1960s. <coughs> with the assistance of the CIA and the Green Berets, General Vang Pao, a Hmong leader, and tens of thousands of Hmong soldiers whom he commanded were the frontline defense responsible for warding off the communist advance until the American evacuation in 1973. The staggering cost of Hmong sacrifice during this period is really important to know. Throughout 13 years of fierce guerrilla warfare, estimates claim that one in four Hmong soldiers, approximately 17,000 people, died. And some of the Hmong soldiers who died were teenagers, were quite young. The Secret War entered a new phase in 1973 when the United States signed a peace accord with North Vietnam and evacuated all of the American military leaders from Laos. But 18,000 Hmong soldiers were left behind. Some dispersed into the countryside, some joined the General Army. In 1975, Vang Pao and some military leaders were airlifted by the CIA out of Laos. But most Hmong people were less fortunate. Of the 10,000 Hmong who flooded the headquarters at Long Cheng, only a small fraction were evacuated by the United States. Thousands of Hmong people therefore embarked on the treacherous westward exodus to Thailand. Carrying their possessions on their back, families traveled by foot through the jungle and journeyed at night to avoid capture by the communists. By 1979, nearly 30,000 Hmong refugees attempted to make the dangerous crossing each month. So that crossing of the river is such a powerful part of Hmong stories of their refugee migration. And you can see it powerfully depicted here. Now Americans today have paid attention to news of refugee crises overseas. They've been following news reports, they've been watching footage on nightly news, they've been following it on social media, and Americans in the 1970s were just like us today. They were following developments overseas with great interest. And Americans who were moved by news accounts of this humanitarian crisis, um, this was a really important development in causing Americans to say, we should actually do something. The plight of Southeast Asian refugees began to build, uh, and Americans began to push to provide relief and resettlement opportunities. So today, or first I want to talk about support for Southeast Asian refugees. Americans gave a lot of reasons to support these Southeast Asian refugees. For one, many Americans rooted their support in the idea that the United States is an exceptional country, an immigrant country that has special status in history as a refuge for the scorned, hated, and hunted. One 1975 public opinion survey found that the leading reason why Americans supported the admission of Southeast Asian refugees was the, quote, tradition of the United States as a sanctuary for Europeans fleeing oppression of their homelands. 
That same poll found that a plurality agreed with the statement that the United States began with people of all races, creeds, and nationalities coming here to escape religious or pers political persecution. So we ought to let the refugees from Vietnam in. Throughout the Cold War, Americans continued to feel a special obligation to people who were fighting against communism, people who were the less fortunate hum be human beings who faced retribution and persecution. And this was also another reason why a lot of Americans were open to accepting Southeast Asian refugees. A 1986 poll found that a majority of respondents agreed that the United States should accept political refugees who were specifically fleeing communist countries. And there was also the specific context of the Vietnam War. The fact that refugees were fleeing a region where the United States had been directly involved in years of brutal warfare heightened Americans' sense of obligation. Americans were particularly committed to admitting Southeast Asian refugees who had worked closely with the U.S. military, with the CIA, as translators or in the diplomatic corps. Americans who had worked in Vietnam felt terrible about potentially abandoning their Southeast Asian colleagues. And other refugee advocates argued that Americans must aid and admit Southeast Asian refugees whose suffering was the direct consequence of U.S. military action. For some religious people, accepting refugees for resettlement was an act of penance for America's sins in Vietnam. Just as powerful as American guilt was the idea of American goodness. Pride in American compassion and generosity spurred Americans to take action. The idea that the United States was the benevolent leader of the free world also converged with religious ideas. The idea that the United States needed to be the good Samaritan. Finally, refugee advocates argue that Americans should not admit refugees because Americans are good, but because refugees are good for America. One Senate resolution from 1975 declared, this period of influx of refugees and exiles can serve to keep us humble, saving us from the sins of arrogance, pride, and self-righteousness. Now, I need to tell you, this support for refugees really was small compared to the opposition to refugees. Despite the lofty ideals and passionate advocacy of refugee supporters, in reality, the majority of Americans consistently opposed the resettlement of Southeast Asian refugees. And this sentiment was by no means a new development in American culture. Public opinion polls indicate that consistently throughout the 20th century, Americans have not supported the admission and resettlement of refugees. For example, in January 1939, as the U.S. was grappling with the question of whether to accept Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany, only 30% of Americans surveyed said that the U.S. should resettle Jewish refugees. 61% said it should not. Now compare that to public opinion polls after the Vietnam War. One national Gallup poll in May 1975, which is right after the fall of Saigon, found that only 36% of Americans surveyed favored the resettlement of Southeast Asian refugees. 54% of Americans surveyed opposed it. Attitudes towards Southeast Asian refugees did warm somewhat over time, but American reluctance to admit Southeast Asian refugees remained fairly consistent throughout the 1970s and 80s. Even a full decade after the end of the Vietnam War, a plurality of Americans believed that the United States had accepted too many refugees. And as this slide indicates, I added some statistics from October 2016. 41% of registered American voters said that the U.S. should accept Syrian refugees. 54% said it should not. So this is interesting because more Americans are supportive of refugee resettlement today than compared to after the Vietnam War, which I think is a surprising statistic for a lot of people. 
So why do people oppose Southeast Asian refugees? The New York Times, shortly after the fall of Saigon, visited a town called Niceville, Florida. That's actually its name, Niceville. The truth is that the town was not particularly nice to the refugees who were arriving from Vietnam. Niceville is located near Eglin Air Force Base, which was the site of one of the four military-run refugee camps. And despite the proximity to Vietnamese refugees, or perhaps because of it, the people of Niceville revealed the limited limits of American um, welcome. A local radio station polled area residents about the 1,500 Vietnamese refugees being airlifted from Saigon. And 80% of the people said that they did not want the military to bring refugees to their town. At one point, residents actually circulated a, a petition demanding that refugees be sent to a different place, and school children made jokes about shooting refugees. As far as I'm concerned, they can ship them all right back, one woman told the New York Times. This woman's support for sending refugees back to Vietnam reflected broader national sentiment. In one national poll in June 1975, 85% of Americans believed that the United States was too panicked when Saigon fell and that the government should arrange to send these refugees back to Saigon. In Valparaiso, which is a town close to Niceville, anxiety about refugees reflected anxiety about economic issues, the stagnating economy, and weakening social safety net. We've got enough of our own problems to take care of, said Grady Tomberlin a local barber. One of his customers agreed they don't even have enough money to take care of Social Security now and they want to bring in more people. These economic concerns were also in keeping with national sentiment. Many Americans believed that Southeast Asian refugees posed an economic burden on the U.S. A survey in June 1975 found that 62 percent of Americans believed that immigrants take jobs away from Americans only 28% believed otherwise. And then there were issues other than economic issues. For one, there was concern about security, about communists slipping in with the refugees. And this sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? Robert Carr, a realtor in nearby, Val nearby Valparaiso, feared that Vietnamese refugees would bring communist infiltrators. How do you know we're not gonna get the bad guys, he said. You can't say for sure. Nobody can, and Lord knows we got enough communist infiltration right now. He wasn't alone in his concerns. This topic also came up in discussions in Congress. In 1975, Ambassador L. Dean Brown, who led the Ford administration's response to Southeast Asian refugees, responded to several questions from Congress about the adequacy of the Immigration and Naturalization Services security screening which many saw as overstretched and pressured to maximize expediency over thoroughness. There were also cultural concerns. Americans opposed to refugee resettlement argued that Southeast Asian refugees were culturally unassimilable, a danger to American well-being. And here you see the emergence of language that echoes the yellow peril language that we saw earlier in American history. Opponents of refugee resettlement portrayed Southeast Asian people as vice and germ-ridden people who threatened public health. There's no telling what kind of diseases they'll be bringing with them, said Vincent Davis of Niceville. And when asked to identify what diseases exactly they might be bringing, he couldn't quite name them. He said, I don't know, but there's bound to be some kind of those tropical germs floating around. Hostility to Southeast Asian refugees sometimes boil down to simple racism. At Fort Walton Beach High School, for example, which was near Niceville, students discussed plans to establish a Gook Klux Klan. So this is, in many ways, resonant with what we're hearing today, a variety of reasons why people are concerned about admitting refugees. The funny thing about refugees, the funny thing about Southeast Asian refugees, is that given all of this hostility, it actually happened. Southeast Asian refugees were actually admitted and resettled. As the historian Karl von Tempel put it, given the intensity of this public opposition, it's a miracle that Southeast Asian refugees were resettled in the United States at all. And they were resettled 
in substantial numbers. Between 1975 and 2000, over a million Southeast Asian refugees came to the United States. And what was the most extensive, expensive, and institutionally complex resettlement effort in American history? It was also haphazard, chaotic, controversial, and planners expected it would take a year, but it ended up taking decades. Southeast Asian refugee migration developed in several phases. There was first the Indochina Migration and Refugee Assistance Act in 1975. This outlined the first plans to help refugees from Vietnam and Cambodia. <coughs> in these efforts, the federal government gravely underestimated how expensive it would be, how much money was needed, how much time and manpower. And so in the years that followed, Congress approved the arrival of more refugees, including Lao and Hmong refugees, in a series of stopgap measures. By 1978, the stream of Southeast Asian refugees became a tide, as more Vietnamese, Cambodian, lowland Lao, and Hmong refugees began to come to the U.S. So President Jimmy Carter raised the quota of incoming refugees to 14,000 people per month in 1979, and there remained the challenge of bringing these refugees to a level of self-sufficiency. To meet these needs, Congress passed a landmark piece of legislation, the Refugee Act of 1980. And this is really important because it's the act under which we operate still today. It aimed to fix the inefficiencies in the resettlement program, and it also maintained much of the pre-existing program, but aimed to make it more permanent and stable. It capped refugee annual entries at 50,000. It created new admissions procedures that facilitated the efficient resettlement of refugees. It provided long-term funding for refugee programs. So it was the first general refugee act. Up until 1980, the United States had been under criticism for only helping people who were anti-communist, rather than people who really needed to be helped. Refugee policy, critics argued, should not be driven by Cold War geopolitics, but by international laws and norms. So the 1980 Refugee Act is also important because it redefined refugee in American law. It defines refugees as any person who is outside his or her own country, who is unable or unwilling to return to that country, as your point raised earlier, and is unable or unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country out of fear of persecution because of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and more. So Southeast Asian refugee resettlement, given its complexity, helped illuminate the need for the 1980 Refugee Act, and that's why it's important. But it also marked an important shift the shift towards centering refugee admissions on human rights rather than Cold War anti-communism. And this period generally saw a shift towards human rights, humanitarian thinking. Not everyone was in, on board with this. Gerald Ford continued to make the argument that we should admit refugees because they had been the United States' ally in its fight against communism globally. But liberal pro-refugee advocates like Senator Ted Kennedy emphasized that Southeast Asian refugees deserved American help due to a more responsibility to alleviate suffering. So what happened to these refugees once they arrived in the United States? How were they resettled? A lot of conversation focuses on admission, but we also need to think about how refugees were resettled, because successful refugee resettlement made policymakers more likely to want to admit more refugees. And refugee admissions and refugee resettlement in this way are very intertwined. In the United States, refugee resettlement is a public-private effort. The government delegates a lot of work to private agencies called voluntary agencies. Interestingly, a lot of these agencies are also religious. 75% of Southeast Asian refugees who arrived in 1981, which was roughly the midpoint of Southeast Asian refugee arrivals, uh, were resettled by religious organizations. Some of these organizations are ones that are very active and prominent today. Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, for example, and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. 
So religious organizations were very important in both advocating for increased refugee admissions and also doing the work of helping refugees make a new life in the United States. These voluntary agencies received a government grant between $300 and $500 per refugee to help refugees in their first few weeks upon arrival. And these voluntary agencies also partnered with local organizations, sometimes an individual, usually a community group, especially a congregation, a synagogue, or a church. And these churches um, or civic organizations would sponsor refugees and sort of take them under their wing. Sometimes refugees would actually live in church buildings for their first few days in the United States. I interviewed one family um, or one church sponsor that had housed the family in their church and they didn't have showers so the refugees lived in the Sunday school classrooms and then walked across the street to the seminary uh, and took showers there and they lived like that for a few weeks. This actually came up in the movie Gran Torino, which I know some of you have seen. In that film, Clint Eastwood is talking to a young Hmong woman and asks, how did you get here to the rural Midwest? And she jokingly says, blame the Lutherans. And I think that scene in Gran Torino says very succinctly one important theme. Religious organizations, religious groups have been powerful in advocating for refugee admissions, and they have been really important to making refugee resettlement happen. They did so for a variety of reasons. As this flyer from Church World Service points out, churches, in their view, are avenues of God's love to refugees. The last line is pretty important here, articulating how Protestant Christians viewed refugees. It says, Jesus, who himself was a refugee, said that by helping refugees, we are really helping him. So these religious groups had a lot of commitment to helping refugees, and they also had the financial backing of the government to do that work. So the United States refugee program would not have happened without these private organizations. Now, they had their own goals for resettling refugees, but uh, religious groups and government had a shared objective, which is bringing refugees to self-sufficiency as soon as possible. This quote from Mark Franken of the Migration and Refugee Service in the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops illuminates that. He says, I'm advising someone who wants to make a difference and wants to get involved in that effort, but also advise that their role is not to be everything for the newcomer. Their role is to help them be as self-sufficient as soon as possible. Don't create dependencies. That's the worst thing for an individual, is to create a dependency. This reflected the government's goal of resettling refugees in a way that would not put a lot of people on welfare. This was an obsession of both government and private agencies involved in resettlement. So the number one goal was to ensure that refugees would not be a public charge, would be economically self-sufficient, would have a job, and if they were children, would go to school. But there were also uh, commitments to cultural assimilation. And to that end, refugees were actually spread out across the country. As one person put it, spread thin like butter, so they might disappear. And there was a desire on the part of refugee policymakers to prevent the formation of immigrant enclaves that characterized refugee and immigrant uh, migrations earlier in the U.S., in U.S. history. So my final portion today, I want to talk about how refugees experienced this migration. In my view, a lot of our conversation about refugee migrations today takes in consideration the needs of government. It takes into consideration the needs of sponsors, of community members. It doesn't always involve listening to Southeast Asian refugee voices. So in general, I will say uh, that refugees were grateful to be resettled in the United States, but they were also deeply unsettled by the experience. They faced a number of challenges, economic challenges, cultural adjustment, language acquisition, trauma due to war, physical and mental health problems due to war also intense anti-refugee hostility and racism, the separation from family and friends, the uncertainty of what future lay ahead. I think 
one of the most powerful ways to understand what it was like to experience this refugee migration is to listen to oral histories. And so I'm going to call attention to your Mua's story. Your Mua is a Hmong woman who currently lives in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and she shared her story through the Hmong Women's Action Team Oral History Project, which is at um, the Minnesota Historical Society. I'll share a few lines that I think illuminate some of the challenges she experienced. At the welfare office, he told me that, how come you did not go to work? And why are you just coming to ask for more money? That is what he told me. But he did not know how much struggling we had been through. He did not know how lucky we are to stay alive so we could come to this country. Maybe he would still say all those things about us. The reason why we are having this problem is because of the Americans who came to our country and caused all these problems. That is the reason why we came to this country. But he does not know about that. And all he sees is that we are here to use his money and take his country and his home. They really hate the people who are on welfare like us. For those who went to work to support their own families, then the Americans said that now they are taking away our jobs. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. Why does your Mua feel frustrated with life in America? What are her frustrations? She's frustrated because the welfare um, office is like assuming that her story without really knowing her. Mm -hmm. And it kind of actually reminds us of like the last discussion and how, and the perception of like Americans towards like Muslim America. Mm -hmm. So like, I think it's just that like, they're not really taking account her experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a frustration, absolutely, of Americans not fully understanding why Hmong people are coming to the United States in the first place. This is a big issue for a lot of Hmong refugees. We had fought on your side. And why are you hating us now? There was a lot of frustration with the lack of understanding and the lack of history. And by sharing stories through things like oral history projects and memoirs and fiction, I think Hmong people, Vietnamese people, have been able to tell their story in a to a wider audience and improve understanding. But in those first years, they didn't really have a platform to tell their story and to improve understanding as easily as they do now, for sure. Kao Kalia Yang is also a Hmong American woman. She lived in St. Paul. You read her memoir, an excerpt from her memoir, The Late Homecomer, for today. You know, I want to call attention to a few lines that I think are really powerful from the text you read. She came to the United States as a child, and so she has the unique position of experiencing a refugee migration from the vantage point of a young person, which is quite different from your Mua, who came to the United States as an adult. Kalkalia Yang writes, my, father, my mother and father told us not to look at the Americans. If we saw them, they would see us. For the first year and a half, we wanted to be invisible. Everywhere we went beyond McDonough, McDonough Housing Project, we were looked at and we felt exposed. We were dealing with a widespread realization that all Hmong people must do one of two things to survive in America, grow up or grow old. Okay, so she felt profound pressure to grow up really fast, translating for her parents, helping them navigate the bureaucracy that allowed their family to eat, Later, she writes, money was like a person I had never known or a wall I had never breached before. <clears throat> it kept me away from my grandma. I saw no way to climb this wall. Sometimes I thought so much about money that I couldn't sleep. Money was not bills and coins or a check from welfare. In my imagination, it was much more. It was the nightmare that kept love apart in America. So here you have another aspect of frustration. Her family's not just financially struggling, but that financial struggle meant that they could not be with loved ones. And this was a really powerful aspect of refugee migrations, is the fact that people might be separated for years from family members, might not even know what their status is. 
one last line from the memoir. At night, the families gathered for long conversations, which were always about surviving in America, the same topic that the adults in my family started the first night we arrived in the country. It was a conversation that would continue for the next 20 years. How do we survive in America and still love each other as we had in Laos? So what are some things that Kao Kalia Yang did to survive? Anyone remember from the text? What did she do to survive? What was her strategy for survival? How to connect to her commitment to education. For Kao Kalia Yang, the way to survive was to do well in school. A tremendous amount of pressure on her in this story to do well academically, to maybe go to college someday. And one thing that I think is really powerful about learning about Southeast Asian American history is it reminds us that Asian Americans are not a monolithic model minority, that there are a variety of different backgrounds, experiences that shape their migration to the United States and the ways that they're able to thrive in the United States. What's amazing to see is how much upward mobility has been accomplished by a lot of these refugees within the span of a generation. I once interviewed a Hmong woman who described how she gave birth on the side of the Mekong River to a baby. And she couldn't immediately swim across the Mekong River because she had just given birth and the baby was so small. But as soon as she was able, she did. And her husband carried one child on his shoulders and she carried the newborn baby. And they swam across the river as troops were shooting at them. And I asked after she told this story, well, what happened to that baby that you carried? And she said, oh, she's a law student at UC Berkeley now. So I think it's really powerful to remember how much struggle Southeast Asian refugees have experienced due to war, due to upheaval, due to dislocation, culturally, politically, economically, it's powerful. But I also think we do a disservice by just focusing on success stories. And I want to conclude here. Kalkalia Yang is a success story. Viet Tan Nguyen is a success story, award-winning Southeast Asian authors and professors. But just like how the model minority mythology is so problematic, so too is a narrative of Southeast Asian refugee migrations that only focuses on success. And increasingly, you see a lot of Southeast Asian refugees telling stories about their struggle, pointing out the unsettledness of resettlement, um, not simply to correct the narrative, but also to intervene in contemporary debates in the present about refugees today. So I want to revisit Viet Thanh Nguyen now. I want to read a few lines that are from the same essay that I quoted at the beginning of this lecture. And here Viet Thanh Nguyen writes about the hidden scars all refugees carry. And he connects the past and the present in the same way that Japanese Americans who had been incarcerated during World War II have been intervening in debates about treatment of Muslims during the War on Terror. We see Southeast Asian Americans drawing on their own refugee past to stand up for refugees in the present. Viet Thanh Nguyen writes, Today, when many Americans think of Vietnamese Americans as a success story, we forget that the majority of Americans in 1975 did not want to accept Vietnamese refugees. For a country that prides itself on the American dreams, refugees are simply un-American, despite the fact that some of the original English settlers of this country, the Puritans, were religious refugees. Today, Syrian refugees face a similar reaction. To some Europeans, these refugees seem un-European, for reasons of culture, religion, and language. And in Europe and the United States, the attacks in Paris, Brussels, San Bernardino, California, and Orlando, Florida, have people fearing that Syrian refugees could be Islamic radicals, forgetting that those refugees are some of the first victims of the Islamic State. And here it's a really powerful connection to the perception of Vietnamese refugees as potential communist infiltrators when they were ones who 
re fleeing persecution at the hands of communists in Asia. I continue here. Because those judgments have been rendered on many who have been cast out or who fled, it's important for those of us who were refugees to remind the world of what our experiences mean. A Vietnamese colleague of mine once jokingly referred to his journey from refugee, refugee to bourgeoisie. When I told him I too was a refugee, he stopped joking and said, you don't look like one. He was right. We can be invisible even to one another. But it is precisely because I do not look like a refugee that I have to proclaim being one, even when those of us who were refugees would rather forget that there was a time when the world thought us to be less than human. So I will close there. Any questions about any of the material I've lectured about today? Okay, thank you. I will see you all next week discussing the sympathizer and the Bon Tempo chapter. I wish you a wonderful weekend. Now I can actually say that.